the what? But anyway. Recording is on. Okay, so uh, tonight uh, Eric's got a, a circuit to, to discuss he'd like to talk about, so we'll do that first. And then after that, we'll get into a little bit of a discussion with the uh, about how we would like to uh, our, our homebrew meetings going forward, both Mixer and uh, the regular one, uh, what your ideas are, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And then we can get into a round table after that. And if anybody else has any questions, queries, or anything you want to discuss, well, just uh, just bring them up. And I'll probably have a ton of questions for you next month there, Wayne, because I've been doing a lot of KeyCat of late, especially especially libraries. <laughs> okay, um, Eric, it's all yours. How's that? Uh, sure. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Let me just get set up here. Um, and I'll... A little background too. Uh, let's blow this up a little bit. Give me. Okay. So a little background as well. Uh, actually, um, so uh, this was supposed to be a component corner again this evening, but uh, and I was going to talk all about inductors. Actually, I came across an interesting article that delve into some of the depths of inductors. Uh, uh, but I kind of got sidetracked over the last uh, half week or so, something like that, um, trying to get my first uh, input, uh, computer input into a radio. Uh, I've never actually done that before, so this was kind of new territory for me. Uh, I don't have any fancy radios that have USB ports on them, uh, so um, I'm, I guess, the most technologically competent radio that I've got is my FT817 that uh, I wanted to build an interface for. I had CAD control on it, which is fine, and I could get audio out of it. Uh, that was pretty uh, pretty straightforward, but it was getting audio back into the radio that was presenting the challenge. So um, anyway, so I've got this. Uh, so what I did is I breadboard, breadboarded up a circuit and uh, I will attempt to share what I modeled here. And so this is not quite as much a uh, presentation as a, I don't know, see what I've done and, uh, you know, soliciting some comments. So uh, let me get into sharing mode here. Um, I want to share a tab. Chrome tab. Let's try that. So how's that? Can everybody see? Uh, my yeah. Circuit there? yeah, yeah, we can see that. Okay. Hmm. All right. So this is my uh, attempt at making what I think is an attenuator circuit. So um, I guess I should stop this because it's running right now. But um, anyway, so I built it in real life first uh, and then did this simulation. Uh, again, this is my first time at both, uh, you know, making this or trying to make this attenuator. So it's pretty simple. There's nothing to it. So uh, and it did work, actually, uh, more or less. But um, swapping out some of the components is what I'm kind of interested in seeing, you know, what makes a difference. It's I, I wouldn't say it's quite perfect. But uh, I certainly was able to get uh, input into the computer. Uh, sorry, yeah, into the uh, into the transceiver from the computer. So, uh, so anyway, again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. This is Falstead, right? Um, uh, I don't even know actually how to get like the scope thing. I think there's a way of getting a scope display at the bottom or whatever. Um, all I did was put in these. I don't know test points or whatever. And uh, uh, I guess this one, this one, that, that's the the, the, the the voltmeter or whatever, whatever I have there, I guess. Um, but um, anyway, so uh, like I said, the circuit did work. Um, what I was trying to do with this uh, was some CW. Okay, so uh, decoding CW, I mean, even before I had these circuits and just like plugging in the raw, you know, output from the radio into the computer, uh, 
got me decoding, but still kind of choppy. I'm using FL Digi to uh, decode the CW. And I mean, it comes in, I don't know how perfect it's supposed to be, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there's still a lot of uh, de human deciphering that has to be done uh, with it, I find. And maybe that's because I was uh, overloading the, you know, the, 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 the what the computer is expecting to see and it was getting distorted. So uh, that's kind of part the reason why I'm, you know, building this uh, little circuit here. Um, so that would be on uh, this side of it here, going from the speaker on the transceiver into the computer. Um, but kind of this is the new part of it here, really, which I've never, again, this is the first time ever I've gotten the computer uh, output going into the transceiver. Um, so, uh, I actually participated in the Carex uh, QSO yesterday evening, and it was just Frank and I that was on. And um, so an interesting observation there, I asked him for a uh, signal report. And when I was using the computer to send CW, he said he could barely hear it. It was buried in the noise, uh, essentially. And then I just... Uh, switched over to using paddles, and he said the you know, signal was much stronger. I don't know, you know, an order of magnitude, but significantly much more readable and uh, audible. So, uh, so I realized a few things here. One is that when I'm using the paddles, I'm actually doing I don't know proper CW if that's what it's called, where I'm uh, I guess turning the oscillator on and off. Uh, whereas with this, it's doing something called modulated CW, right? So um, I guess that's maybe a weaker signal or something harder to pick up with a human ear. Um, before I was talking to him, I had actually been trying uh, to ping the RBN uh, network, you know, the, the River's Beacon network uh, with this, with the, the keyboard, uh, you know, the modulated C CW and couldn't get picked up at all. So I'm guessing that the receivers for the RBN are not able to understand modulated CW. That's really only for human decoding. So anyway, I'd like somebody to correct me if I'm wrong and how I'm thinking on that. So um, anyway, so so here we are. Uh, this is what I've got. Um, again, when I, 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 again, I'm just sort of hacking around here. Um, I'm assuming that what is the uh, input here on uh, um, this side here is I've selected this correctly, um, being a, I want an AC uh, going in here. I don't know, I just kind of selected 12 volts and 10 kilohertz frequency, uh, assuming that's kind of in the middle of the audio range roughly, um, and then seeing what's coming out on the other side. So. I guess what I'm trying to do here is, you know, instead of like just sort of randomly swapping out values here, or I could put in a potentiometer, I guess, in these, and then I could have a variable or whatever, but I'm assuming this is what's doing the attenuation, this resistor, these resistor bridges or whatever here, um, and seeing what's on the opposite side, and I guess the vice versa, coming out of the radio, going into the, uh, um, into the computer on this side. So, I mean, eh, I don't know, like, obviously I'm seeing, you know, 12 volts out here and then, you know, I'm not even sure what, I, that's why I'd like to maybe figure out how to get the scope thing going here. Cause you're just sort of like watching this and stopping it. And then, you know, it seems to vary between very small voltages there. And then, I don't know, this seems to be wildly going from like minus 12 to plus 12 or something. So I'm not sure if this is actually a proper simulation or if I've done something wrong here or if I'm choosing the wrong components, whatever. So uh, anyway, there you are. This is what I'm trying to learn and uh, figure out. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I have to present. So again, a bit of a work in progress, but uh, if anyone has any input as to what, uh, you know, if anything I'm uh, uh, able to, you know, change here and do on this to make a better simulation. Uh, I'm all ears, so. Well, I've got a couple of comments for you, Eric. Okay. Um, I think if you're trying to copy over the air uh, and seeing if your setup's working properly, maybe try and copy the ARRL uh, CW practice because that's probably about as good code as you're going to get, right? So right, that eliminates you know because you were questioning whether or not you were you're you're getting D 
decent CW to, to, to uh, copy. So you can try that. The other one is uh, too, you said you uh, built the circuit first and then you simulated. That kind of goes uh, ass about face, doesn't it? <laughs> Sim uh, simulate like first. And then when yeah, you get yeah. yeah. I just, I wanted to, I was like, when I came, like, you know, whatever, I wanted to see if it worked, basically, you know, yeah. uh, in, in real life. Uh, and then I guess, yeah, you're right. I mean, the I'm tweaking. I need to talk to you because the idea is to simulate it first and spice and then to see if it if it's going to come close to working in the end breadboard. But hey, we won't split hairs with you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the other one is to why why I, I'm curious. I'm not familiar with this other program you're using, but I was curious uh, uh, why you weren't using uh, LT Spice. Yeah. Well, again, this is quick and dirty, right? This is just a web applet, or I don't know, whatever, uh, Falstead, right? So uh, uh, I've not looked I'll at it before for circuit simulations, but you suggest trying uh, to get familiar with LT Spice for even simple things like this. Well, yeah, because there's a few of us in this group that use LT Spice, so you might as well get started with it. And then if you have questions, you, you know where to go, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Now, you were commenting, my last comment, and I'll turn it over to somebody else, but I was just going to say you weren't sure if you had the right components. Um, I, did you take a look and see what the maximum and minimum voltages you needed to have, and then did the calculation for the voltage divider so that you would get the appropriate voltages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I didn't do that. Again, this is just all arbitrary here on the inputs here. And I assume I'm using like, it's, again, it's just an audio input source. But um, I mean, I'm assuming uh, I picked right that it is an AC uh, uh, that's we're dealing with here, right? It's audio. Um, but you know, what voltage? I don't know, I guess I could put a probe on the like, like, like an actual uh, voltmeter on the uh, circuit that I have in real life. And then plug that in here, that might be a better way of uh, doing it rather than just assuming what kind of voltage is coming out, right? Uh, Reed, take a look and see what you're supposed to supply and then go from there. Uh, Frank has a comment. Yes, uh, <clears throat> my comment is uh, basically uh, uh, look at what you're trying to achieve. Uh, are you trying to uh, uh, learn a new circuit or trying to learn something about electronics and whatnot, that uh, your approach is great and uh, just, just go ahead. If, however, you're trying to get the uh, computer connected to the um, ham station, your H17 or whatever, then uh, I would not use that approach. Um, we did a, a build-a-thon that did exactly that. And what we used was two um, transformers and uh, the first thing to be successful is you need uh, isolation between the ham rig and the computer. And the one-to-one -one transformers, and I think they're around 600 ohm, not just audio transformers. Yes. Uh, the one-to-one -one transformers not only gave that uh, um, isolation, but it gave a perfect match. So a uh, quick and dirty way to get on the air with this um, it is go that that route, and uh, the uh, the manual is probably still still online for that. Uh, it gives you a schematic, but but there's not nothing to it. It's just a one to one transformers. But however, you want to learn uh, um, some electronics and whatnot, uh, go ahead and have a ball. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think I think I actually just bought recently a bag of those audio isolation transformers. Uh, so yeah, that would actually be easy uh, to do. But okay, so you're saying there might be something in the uh, uh, archives uh, for the interface that you made, right? I don't know if we uploaded that stuff, Frank. Uh, if not, uh, I guess I can contact you, Frank, right? But there's the schematic. You're talking about the digital interface, right, Frank? Yeah, the digital interface. Uh, that's the schematic there. And that and that one is more involved. That was a version two of it, I think. Uh, I can't Which remember. Which had the in it and stuff like that. Yeah. The, anyway, the uh, but that yeah, you're right with the, that's the transformers we used on the project. But there was more stuff involved there, and I can't remember what that extra circuit was for. I think. To do the actual interfacing, you just need this portion here. I think this had something else going on, but I don't really remember what it was. I, I guess I have to read the, the, the booklet on it. 
Do a post to do a post in Eric. You might find somebody uh, is not using one. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, the other thing I think that I've kind of learned here is that CW with these kind of uh, interfaces again, uh, you know, there's there's different ways of doing this, but I think this would probably work better where there's uh, a mode that is just using audio uh, modulation, right? Like the FT8 and that this you know, circuit, I might have more success with it anyway, uh, as far as transmissions and what have you. But again, this was a sort of a quick and dirty uh, attempt here. Um, I suppose that without the isolation transformers, I am, uh, you know, getting whatever, some sort of maybe, yeah. whatever, dirty, dirty signals going through, right? But the whole point was just to reduce the overloading of the, uh, you know, transmission because of the distortion and then on the same way overloading the reception so the decoding would be you know a little bit more difficult so okay uh, for the computer, well, but i find okay. that uh, quick and dirt down and dirty don't never works for me but anyway peter uh you had a comment yeah i not not on the circuit but on the uh, on the software i i played i would say quite a bit with different decoding software to try and decode cw and uh, none of them are very good, <laughs> uh, but but FL Digi is the worst. <laughs> oh really? Oh that's uh, yeah. FL Digi, uh, I had, huh. uh, I you know I there there are like YouTube videos telling you how to tweak the settings for uh, decoding CW on, on FL Digi, and I I went through all of them and set it up, and played with it, and FL Digi was just. It's not. It's not good. <laughs> At least right. I didn't have any luck with it. The one that I found was pretty good, but it just decodes. It doesn't send, uh, and it's not free. But it, it was. It was a couple of bucks, and I. It, it actually worked pretty good. Is one called CW Get? Oh, okay, that's a new one. Um, but uh, yeah, it worked. It worked pretty good, but none of them worked. None of them worked very well. Uh, if uh, the the comment on decoding um, W one AW where they do work pretty good is 100% machine generated code. So they decode perfect code. Uh, somebody sending with a straight key, forget it. You'll never, <laughs> or a bug. Uh, somebody who's really good with the paddle, you do pretty good. Somebody who's using a keyboard or something like W1AW or it's 100% machine, yeah. machine generated is not bad. Perfect, but, okay. Uh, but FL Digi was just, like I say, I, I, I tried, I don't know, maybe six or eight different ones, and it, it was by far the worst. So you, you, you might have better luck with with, uh, with some, some other software. Well, yeah, I mean, the rate, the two reasons I picked it were free and also free, I could spend you probably with already it. Had it. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, that's what I was looking to do is something that I could send with. And I don't think there's too many that are no. send, right? Most of them are just yeah. decode. Most of them are decode. They're, I mean, there's the other way of doing it is like a CW keyboard. Uh, well, I'm wondering, like, what does the group use on field day? I've seen, you know, uh, the CW station using keyboard. And I assume that's to transmit. Uh... Oh, we, we use uh, Winkeer, oh, which is okay. a, like it's a physical device. Right. So the, oh. you, you, you type on the key, you type on the keyboard and then the Winkeer turns it into CW. And actually, it's not audio. It's actually plugs it's... into the the uh, the uh, CW jack on the back right. of the, the, the rig and ah. actually, it actually actually turns it on and off. Right. Okay, so it's hardware. That's really the only yes. way to do that properly. Yeah. Is, <clears throat> and it's yeah. perfect. It's perfect. Right. It does gotcha. a great job. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, it's right. called it's called wind gear. Right. Yes. Uh, and it's a it's a I don't know like hundred hundred and thirty dollar device that you can you can buy. Actually I was gonna get one for myself. Uh, somebody brings it to the the CW station, and I, I thought oh, I probably would enjoy having one of those. And it used to be uh, available as a kit, but now they just sell the uh, completed device. So, like, I took the fun out of it, but I may spring for it one of these days anyway. I wonder if there's a DIY version or somewhere you could, like, you know, brew up a, 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 a cure, cure yeah, that, that I'm you sure, plug I'm a sure keyboard into, you know? Yeah, Doug, Doug Beale built something uh, that he found <laughs> that you actually. You don't use the computer. You plug the keyboard directly into the device. Right. That yeah. that, that then plugs into the the Morse key. So there, there, those are out there for. for well, sure. I assume the the wind just has like a USB or a PS2 port on it, or no? U no? USB. 
Right. So you just plug your keyboard right into it. No computer you required. Your, you, no, no, no. You plug your uh, USB. You, you connect it to the computer via USB. Uh, and then you have to have a piece of software. We okay. actually use the just the regular, what, I can't remember, N, what is it, N3FJP or something like that, the, the field date software. It, yep. it has it has keying in it. It works really well because you, you type the guy's call into the call field. Uh, and then you can hit like F3 and it sends his call to a VE3XR and the exchange and the whole thing. So, okay. you know, there's a bunch of keyboard macros. Yeah. Well, because ideally, for simplicity, you want something with a keyboard, <coughs> or computer required, right? Keyboard just goes right into the interface. Yeah. 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 Huh. Well, those those exist. And I know uh, Doug built, built his. I, I, I can't remember whether he got a kit or whether he maybe got a kit. But anyway, there's a, there are circuits out there. It's not that complicated, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Google might find something there. Uh, Michael, you had a comment. Yes. Um, I uh, built. There's a, there's a digital interface out there by KH6TY, Kilo Hotel Six Tango Yankee. He had a digital interface article in in the QST in March 2011. I built it. I just put it in the chat. I built it and it it works fine. I used it for a while and did other stuff. If you want, I can send you the article, the three-page article, or I can post it on uh, the Homebrew Group someplace. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I can look that up. I've got access to uh, the, that exact one you're saying the article. Yeah. No. Well, I, I yeah. Can... It's March 2011. Yeah. No, I've got access to the QST back issues. So. Yeah. The other okay. comment I had: um, the frequency. You've got 10 kilohertz. Uh, that's too high for the hand bands. You know, you're looking at under three kilohertz between 300 and three three kilohertz audio out of out of a radio. Oh so yeah. If you're simulating stuff. You probably should be looking at that instead oh. of 10 kilohertz. Okay. All right. Yeah. I just again arbitrarily picked that, yeah, I but yeah. uh, I figured uh, you know whatever we go from now. I, I don't know what the resolution is. 20 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz, depending on your age or something like that. But anyway, uh, so 3,000 uh, is a better number to simulate. Okay. Um, all right, great. So I, I assume nobody is really familiar with uh, this, so I should probably abort using this as a simulator and figure out LT Spice, right? Well, that would be a good idea. Get, get with a program, right? As they yeah. say. Well, I think you'd be better off going that route. Might as well get comfortable with LT. You got a simple project there, an easy one to do. So that's yeah. a great way to start learning LT spices with simple projects. And then as you get more comfortable with it, you can, uh, you know, increase the complexity, right? Right. Got it. Okay. okay. Right. Any, more, uh, any more comments for Eric? <clears throat> Hassan. You got something to say there, Hassan? You're muted if you are talking. Actually, you're not showing muted, but we don't hear you. It's gone to get dinner. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we'll come back to this then. Oh, come back to me. Okay. All right. So next up, uh, we got we've done a, a poll. I guess I haven't checked the poll lately. Eric, do you, do you want to just comment quickly on the results of the poll, and then we'll open up a discussion there? I, I guess it really boiled down to three three options and one was clearly i guess really two of them are fairly closely related so it's just a question of what we want to do right mm -hmm. well we got uh, 10 votes all together i just looked at it uh, an hour before the meeting started so position number one is uh both meetings continuing indefinitely virtual having uh uh you know every couple or sorry every uh half year or so having an all day in person sort of uh, show and tell uh, hands on uh, eyeball meeting uh, so we did get a, about half the votes though for um, uh, going to regular meetings uh, uh, in person every three months so basically four times a year we have uh, in person meetings and then everything else is virtual in betweens and all the uh, mixers uh, like this and that was it there was one vote for uh, just outdoor good weather meetings so it looks like the majority of the group either wants to do 
uh, every three months or every six months and everything else virtual. Uh, and I guess, you know, the less times we meet, the more, I don't know, the longer the, the in-person thing would be, the more in-depth. So, so it looks like uh, virtual is here to stay and, uh, you know, sprinkled with either quarterly or uh, semi-annual meetings or, I don't know, split the difference. And every four months we uh, meet in person. So right. whatever. Um, so yeah, that's the poll results. I don't think we're going to get any more uh, no. votes. It's been up for a couple of weeks now. And uh, yeah. uh, most of the people that uh, are able to attend in person, which is really, I guess, the who the poll was aimed at, uh, have responded. So. Yeah, I guess we're getting more and more a little bit further afield and uh, long distance uh, members joining in that are active. So it makes, seems to make sense. I had a lot of the quarterly meeting in person. I thought, well, that's an interesting one as well. I really like the idea of at least holding a, a, at least one all day e slash evening kind of event where we could actually, uh, you know, maybe do a little bit of presentations, do a, maybe a little bit of operating, maybe a, a, maybe a small build of something or discussions and antenna testing and, you know, who knows all kinds of things maybe hands-on demos of uh things that we've talked about over the over the previous uh several months <laughs> i i think i coined it earlier on like a, a one day in ontario instead of four days in may <laughs> but anyway. and i mean the in-person ones could still be attended by people remotely right you know That's there's right. A reason why yeah. we can't just have a webcam pointed at and a laptop set up uh, with them now the one thing i did think of is that i don't know if anybody's been talking to simon uh, of late but I don't even know if Simon would even, you know, if we went to quarterly in person, where would we hold it? So that's one thing we have to think about. Okay, uh, um, uh, Ken had his hand up. Yeah, I, I think uh, indefinitely is just, it's depending on if and when this uh, pandemic is, uh, we come out of it, uh, then we can make another decision afterwards. Um, eventually, we're going to get out of this. We have to. Yeah. Well, I, th I think a lot of people, it's not just us, but I think a lot of people have discovered that the uh, online, you know, these kinds of meetings, uh, the Zooms and the Jitsis of the world are, aren't a bad way to conduct things. And uh, and uh, so I think there is a place for both. But uh, anyway, uh, okay. Anybody else have comments, preferences? Even uh, if we have an in-person meeting, how would we conduct it, whether it be the quarterly or an annual one or semi-annual? I think people were leaning more to the, uh, you know, two twice a year or four times a year, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. Yeah, the, the other question is, when do we you know, start this, right? Uh, you know? well, I think, uh, I think uh, July comes to mind for one of them. Last, uh, week, last weekend in June. Uh, some of us will be busy then. Well, no, last weekend. <laughs> last, yeah. <laughs> Just like we did this year. Yeah. No, that was fun. That was fun. No, that'd be, that'd be an additional event, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's over and above. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no comments? Wow. Well, means everybody's happy. Oh, okay. With, with the results. Very good. So, All right. Um, let's see what else is on the go here. Well, that's pretty much it there, other than maybe up for a round table. So uh, I know, Michael, you wanted to get going fairly soon there did you want to just go how about if we start with a little bit of round table with you michael and then uh, then it's <laughs> well my my activity has been zero so that's easy <laughs> i haven't done anything i've been working doing woodworking stuff and yard work and things like that so i, I just haven't i just haven't had time yeah okay <laughs> aside from aside from uh, i forget if i talked about this before i borrowed our club uh, stations uh, ft2000 <clears throat> to compare it to my FT-1000 MP, because the 2000 is the later iteration of it. It went FT-1000 FT MP, then they did the Mark V, and then they did the 2000. I thought, well, you know, might be worth uh, thinking about switching from the MP to the 2000. But the MP, the 2000 uses digital DSP filters. And, you know, the kind of stuff I do, which is DXing, not worth the effort, so I'm keeping my MP which is pretty good anyway. So that's what I, that's but the only thing I've done radio wise or homebrew wise at all. Okay. Well, thanks for that, that update, uh, Michael. I, uh, myself, I've been, uh, while well, working with Kevin a little bit on this uh, antenna, antenna mapping project. And 
fairly quickly on, we decided to scrap the Arduino in it and uh, go to uh, the uh, blue pill. So Kevin's got a little bit of pinout work to do there and actually to get the uh, software to work with the with it and the libraries and all that kind of good stuff. But I know he's been pretty busy and uh, so he's uh, got a little bit more to do on that one. In the meantime, I've been uh, digging up uh, footprints and symbols for the blue pill and and uh, foot and um, um, Arduino stuff and all kinds of stuff like that and trying to put that together. So I've been kind of working on that, but I'm getting pretty close to where I'm going to need some pinouts from Kevin soon. But anyway, it's a it's a work in progress and uh, and uh, it certainly is a good way to reestablish myself with uh, with KiCad as far as importing libraries and making uh, symbols and all that kind of good stuff. My laptop is a little bit inefficient with that sort of thing, uh, and so I load a keycat on my other computer and and hopefully i'm <laughs> i've some of the things that i've learned the mistakes i've learned i can uh, correct them in the other on the other computer and other than that and i've not really done any operating uh one of the local guys here he's not he's not with us here tonight he had a there's some guys been uh, experimenting around with a little bit of two meter cw or two meter sideband stuff here and he had a an unused uh, two meter all mode rig, so he lent that to me. And so I haven't quite got it all hooked up and running just yet, but uh, we'll try that. So that'll be a new a new band slash mode for me. Uh, and that's pretty much it from the operating side of things, which I guess means really in reality zero. <laughs> okay, uh, Peter, you're up uh, next on my on my screen here for what activities you've been up to these days. I, I've been busy. I uh, I I. I got an aliexpress account ah. and spent some got carried away <laughs> you don't get any help is what you're saying okay so i bought it i don't know if anybody's seen one of these before but i bought a toy can you see that okay oh is that a programmer of some sort it's a uh, component a tester a tester yeah. so you you plug the component in there's a little little place with a bunch of slots in it I, so I plugged a transistor in there and you plug whatever it in and press the button oh, yeah. and it I don't know if you can see this can you see that well we can see that so, can't read it but we can see it <laughs> can't read. it's it's it says it's an NPN transistor and uh, one is the emitter two is the collector and three is the base and it's uh, got a bunch of uh, you know uh, statistics on it and it would you can put I put a transistor in a capacitor an inductor resistor diode shows you yeah. which direction the diode goes and it's, it's yeah. kind of cool all those, all those little details things uh, it might, might help you doing some matching of diodes and all those kinds of things I did it was, so it was, it was 20 bucks yeah they're amazing the price one thing I did notice Pete was uh I did some compare uh, checking with the I have something similar to what you have, yeah. along with the uh, AADE uh, device that we built many, many years ago on a yeah. building. Yeah. And I can't remember which one it is. I think these, like these twenty-dollar ones, are much better at checking like electrolytics or the higher capacitance yeah. Uh, yeah. devices than the AADE. And the ADE is much, much better at checking the capacity, low, small capacitance than right. than the other device. So one does not supersede the other for sure. Right. Yeah. Could, could, uh, I believe it. I just plugged in everything that I had sitting around that I knew what it was and it correctly identified everything. So I thought, well, well I'm not going to complain at that. <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, and then I, I bought and, and put together that, which is called a QRP Pixie. Oh, okay. It's a uh, CW transceiver. Yeah, that was four bucks. <laughs> and, more than four dollars, and, and it included the case. And look at the jack. I mean, it's got a BNC jack on it, and the power jack, and the jack for the microphone, jack for the key. It's a terrible transceiver, but it was fun. <laughs> it was fun to put together when you when you plug it in and put it. It's a, it's forty meters, uh, crystal controlled. Yeah, weird frequency seven zero two three. I don't know what, why seven zero two three, but but uh, but whatever. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll hear you in one of our first <clears throat> first. Uh, month, I'll, I'll give it a shot. But, but when you when when you were hooking up to an antenna and listen to it, you could hear the whole forty meter band. <laughs> 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 
So you're going to need the uh, park audio filter then. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, well, that's pretty good, Peter. Well, maybe yeah. you can join us with your Pixie on one of our the, the first Monday of the month. Uh, CW. I, haven't, I, I haven't built this one yet, but this one appears to be a little bit better. This one was like 10 bucks. It's called a Frog Sounds. Yeah. Oh. CW transceiver. Uh, it's too bad yeah. Drew isn't here tonight because yeah. I think I think Drew uh, built one of those, if I recall. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, it's got, I mean, it's got twice as many components, so I presume. <laughs> <laughs> and it was more than twice the price. Yeah, yeah, but it's got like it's got a couple of ICs in it. It's got, you know, a real a real power transistor with a and a heat sink, and so that's that's my next one. I hadn't heated up the soldering iron in a while, though. I want to make sure that I I decided to start with a four dollar kit. So if I blew it up, okay, as long as you remember which end to pick up on your soldering iron. Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did I I did touch the the wrong end once, but. Uh, <coughs> Okay, very yeah, good. It, it, uh, that's most interesting. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. what you can get off of uh, for really almost next to nothing that would yeah. give you a few hours of entertainment. Oh, yeah, that was fun. That pixie was like two hours, but uh, I'm sure a more skilled builder would have done it in less. But uh, and, and I checked all the components before I put them on the board with, with that to make sure that I was doing it right. So, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty good. And I have one other that hasn't come yet called a Super 49er. So. Oh, that, oh that you're, was, yeah. you're yeah. planning to do some building this year. Yeah, absolutely. That, and that one was like $14, so it, it's got to be great, right? <laughs> Wait till you get up to that $1,000 homebrew rig. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, the miracle, the miracle yep. of Chinese cloning. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> wild, eh? Do they all have FCC logos stamped on the uh, PCBs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 that's, I well, you know that's what? what that is. You'll have to bring it out to one of our first yeah. uh, our, our first homebrew uh, all day session. We'll bring yeah, out for sure. What, what really them. surprised me though is they're they're like really good boards. You know, they're plated through. I, I was I was impressed. They're they're, they're really quite good. Well, <clears> let, <throat> let's get you out on a Monday night and so we can hear it on the air. Yeah. Okay. All right, <laughs> Frank, you're up next. Did you uh, get a better antenna set up there? Although it was working quite well, if I, you know, I could hear you all the way from Kingston on low power, so I guess you shouldn't really disturb that indoor antenna. I'm going to keep that indoor antenna. It seems to work well. <laughs> I used it on Monday uh, and uh, got uh, pretty good reports um, from Eric, so that uh, that worked out well. Um, the project on the bench uh, here is something that uh, started way back uh, before I moved and uh, it uh, kind of uh, picked it up again, but it went in an entirely different direction than I had uh, intended. Um, <clears throat> what it started was a, um, a demonstration of software defined radio that we were intending for uh, Hemex, uh, which never happened because first of all, I wasn't there for Hemex and secondly, Hemex didn't happen. <laughs> uh, so it went in storage and uh, we moved and all the rest of it. So I dragged it back out again. And uh, what it was, was uh, a big board that I had put on um, components or, or kits that we had done in build-a-thons and ended up with a um, Raspberry Pi and a seven inch screen uh, to demonstrate uh, SDR. Well, uh, it got taken apart because I couldn't pack the big board and everything. And uh, <clears throat> so at the end of the move, move out came a, uh, at least a Pi 3. And um, thinking about it, uh, I said, well, maybe I can put a three and a half inch screen on this thing. So um, I did that. And uh, here's the, uh, here's the results. Uh, just a second, see if I can bring, bring this up. Oh yeah. And um, it's in the case, the uh, screens on the top plugged in as a extra board. And um, now my son uh, has a 3D printer, so he printed me up a nice little case for it. And then, uh, let me see, I took that 
and added one of these um, dongles that you might be fam familiar with. Of course, it doesn't uh, receive the uh, ham bands, but if we go to one of our previous projects, which is a little pup, it's got a dongle built into it along with the up converter for the ham bands. So um, I did uh, an extension. Uh, the reason for the extension is because uh, <laughs> if you plug, plug it in, um, the whole thing, whoops, where are we here? <laughs> the whole thing is backwards. So I had to turn this, this over. <laughs> I got a little device to, to turn it over. Now, that then was all very nice, but it started me on an entirely different direction than I had intended to, and that was looking for SDR software that would run on the Raspberry Pi. Back when we made the little pup, um, there were only two uh, SDR program suitable. Uh, one was SD, SD, HD SDR, and the other one was SDR Sharp. Uh, uh, but they only ran on Windows. So looking around for a Linux type program, I was uh, overwhelmed. There's got to be over 25 different Linux programs to run uh, this type of, uh, of setup. And uh, a couple of them even are packaged together with the entire um, um, operating system. So you download that and the operating system. And uh, right now I'm taking uh, um, sampling different ones like uh, GQRX. I've been playing around with that one. And of course, Quisk was the one that we were using uh, uh, back in the original project, and I got that working thanks to uh, Kevin, who helped out on the quiz problems. And uh, but some of the other ones are absolutely re ridiculous. Is uh, SDR Angel, Cloud SDR, Qt SDR, Cubic SDR, SDR Touch, uh, <laughs> and it goes on and on. Uh, Soapy Remote and Lime and things like that. So um, my project now is to go through all of these and find out one that's uh, suitable for a three and a half inch screen. Not all of them work well with such a small screen. Uh, but uh, basically that's what's been keeping me busy for the last little while. I hope you got a comfy chair so you, you're sitting in front of that uh, computer all day trying to sort out which program you want to use, Frank. <laughs> Frank, and I'm finding your same thing. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that some of our uh, homebrew projects we did years ago uh every once in a while finds some new life in some some of our latest endeavors you know and little pup is definitely one that crops up every once in a while for me but uh that's good i, I was surprised at the little pup uh in comparison to uh, history because the uh fellow that de decoded these uh uh um chips inside here and uh, figured out how to work them with, uh, with the ham bands and whatnot. Um, that was in 2012. Our little pup was in 2014. Yeah. So uh, we were kind of on the leading edge at that time. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. Well, it still is actually. But, oh uh, yeah. Uh, Hassan had a comment. Yeah, Frank, I had a question. Could you document your findings? Because I was trying to get an SDR program running and I went through a few of them, like five or six, and I, it's impossible to decide, but I'd love to hear what your, your thought, what your, what your recommendations are on these. Um, I would agree with you, uh, Sam, it is almost impossible to decide now that there's so many, but if I do come up with one that, uh, that is satisfactory and, uh, and solid, Yes, I'll, uh, I'll let everyone know what it is. Great, thank you. Okay, any other comments? Okay, uh, Dwayne, uh, you're up next. And uh, I see you're, uh, you got, I didn't have a chance to really dig into what your last posting, but uh, 
it looks like you're using some uh, online software tools kind of thing to help out with your projects. Yeah, uh, the latest post on there is uh, using a, one of the uh, sound card oscilloscope programs with a little USB sound card uh, for testing out uh, audio amplifiers and that. Uh, I mean, they're a nice little program, depending upon what sound card you've got. you got one or two channel scope. Uh, you've got a two channel audio generator that you can generate signs, squares, triangles, different types of noises and stuff like that and works great for uh, testing out audio stages. Uh, next thing I'm working on on the, on the uh, side, side sideband transceiver is the uh, uh, different version of the VFO BFO. It's going to be the you know basically basic uh, SI5351 on an Arduino, uh, but I brought out a bunch of the other pins, so I'm going to make some little plug-in boards, so until you get to the point where you get a full transceiver on it, I'm going to use some of the stuff for my uh, original uh, scalar network analyzer and stuff like that, and RF voltmeters like that to go and uh, test out the different RF stages as you build them. Uh, and a comment for whoever's had the frog sounds, a uh, little transceiver. I built one of those up a couple of years ago, and I got a very old post on my blog where I built a uh, Arduino VFO for it with uh, built-in keyer and everything. That's about it from here. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Dwayne. Yeah, it's uh, you know, seeing the the project that you're undertaking right now, and the one that uh, Bill Mara is uh, talking about, and what he's doing right now is starting to make. And of course, uh, there are my own Big Slow project with Dave. It's kind of got me thinking about, you know, about our old LBS uh, Let's Build Something project and uh, kind of got me thinking it's time to start doing another project like that. Although I guess I should finish off the uh, D612 project. Uh, Eric, you have anything else to add to what you've been up to? Uh, not a whole lot, really. Uh, you know, this, again, over the past uh, few days, uh, better part of a week. Um, so one thing that uh, I did come across that I wanted to share with the group was this. Uh, again, I'm going to share my screen here. But I don't know how many of you are aware of this. Let me give me a sec here. Uh, how do I want to do this? I want to do this. Share tab. Um, any of you come across this? Uh, probably seen it, but I haven't done anything with it. Yeah, so apparently uh, you, you can get, uh, I don't know what size, but uh, once every month they will send you five boards for free. Uh, costs you nothing for shipping, costs you nothing for the boards. You basically just upload your... Uh, uh your 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 files and um you will get uh you know i don't know uh, probably reasonably sized boards sent to you no charge um you know it's like a prototyping uh, service and i obviously they're hoping that uh when you know you want to do bigger runs uh you're going to go with them but uh they're they, being, they, they started they, this year so will they uh, ship to canada yeah, apparently, uh, you know, the North American shipping, um, I, again, I have not used them. I just came across it, but... Uh, can, you post, uh, can you post that link, Eric? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, send your Gerbers and uh, away you go. Um, uh, so there you go, 2021, uh, free prototyping. So um, anyway, you know, one of us, uh, I don't have anything, uh, obviously, to... Uh, to, to upload to them, but uh, I'm sure one of us here could uh, send a file and just see. I mean, every 30 days it resets and you can get another five boards, uh, no charge shipped to you. Um, yeah, post the link and uh, it might not be too long before I'll, I'll try it out. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Ken, you had a comment? Yeah, is that oh, all PCB? Yeah, that's quite popular with uh, members on all the different forums around. Uh, a lot of people are using that uh, that website. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Uh, yeah, I have to give that a try, especially since my PCB making skills have gone out the window of late. Uh, Hassan, you had a comment? Yeah. Do you remember the story in Aladdin, new lamps for old? <laughs> I mean, all they can think of is, do they 
will they sign an NDA that they're not going to copy your design? They're not going to reproduce it on the side. Uh, right, of course, like, that, right? if, if I can get a free board from them and they want to copy it, they're welcome to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an art in and of itself, getting a non-functional design built and then coming home and fixing it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to cut the trace for it to actually work i guess uh, in the end but uh yeah or whatever i mean but you know like for the kind of stuff that we're hacking together well, what does it matter right so what do you mean the kind of stuff we're hacking together it's highly professional how are you tonight my turn yep oh sorry yeah so um in keeping with the uh, KeyCAD um, um, talks I've been giving, I decided to get off the pot and relearn how to make PCBs. So it's been like uh, 15 years, I think, since I made the last one. And as I really don't like drilling a lot of holes, um, I decided to make a number of footprints suitable for uh, kind of like surface mount that I could put my, my through hole parts on top of the board, kind of like Manhattan style. So I've done that, and then I uh, tried to make the boards for them. So how I did that is I, I actually, I got myself a, um, oh, give me a second here. Uh, uh, rather than using an, uh, an iron, I've got uh, um, the thing you slide the- uh, Laminator? Laminator, thank you. I tip my tongue for a while. So I got a <laughs> laminator. Um, as uh, it has high and almost off, and I was testing it out with uh, um, just basically, I, I, I what I did is I took the small circuit that I was uh, working on that's uh, um, so I can make the PCB small enough. I just cut some pieces off of some scrap and I just cycled them through the laminator, tried to get the uh, um, you know, the um. Uh, toner correct and that sort of stuff. It took me about four tries, but I managed to get it. And I kept records of the temperatures I thought I needed because I, uh, um, I'm understanding it's kind of sensitive. That it needs, it wants to be so hot, but not maybe super, super hot. And uh, so I think I finally got it. I also learned a couple of things about KeyCAD's handling of uh, traces that I didn't spot before. So that'll, that'll figure in uh, next month's talk or this month's talk. What temperature did you find that <clears throat> you needed that worked and what uh, printer are you using? So I have an Epson, what are you? It's a multifunction MSC uh, 9540. Mm -hmm. I found that um, in the first try that I did it, <laughs> the temperature wasn't uh, quite right. And I was uh, trying to wipe off a mark on it and I took the entire PCB apart with my thumb. So that was how I learned I hadn't, uh, I hadn't basically prepared the surface correctly and I hadn't had the right temperature. Temperature uh, that I found worked best was 95C. Um, and that's on my device. I just ran it through any number of times. I had it on high. I'm sure it will go, it'll work on a lower temperature than that, but uh, I just got kind of like high and low and I was trying all those different things. Um, I didn't, I, I forgot the first time to scuff the surface. I had polished it clean and wiped it clean with acetone, but uh, I didn't realize that steel wool is not quite the same as say a, a coarse sandpaper or something like that to, uh, to do it. And that was very necessary. Um, I also seem to see a difference between um, paper. I happen to have two types of gloss paper here at home. Don't know why. And one of them was leaving a film on the surface that, um, I'm not sure I'm reading it right, but it looked to me like the film was blocking the etchant so that I was observing the etchant to kind of, it was coming in on the edges and dissolving the edges, but it wasn't getting in the middle. And the other paper worked well. So I don't know if that was just me. So. Yeah. That's interesting, the temperature you find, because uh, I'm not sure what mine was in Celsius off the top of my head, but I, if I recall correctly, I was finding around 160 Fahrenheit was working, but uh, yeah, that's that's not that's not too far. Like it's, yeah. So, but I, and again, I'm not sure what happened because I never changed the way I was uh, was uh, producing them. But I had a, I just could not uh, get the toner to transfer anymore. So, I, I doubt very much toner 
<laughs> goes bad. <laughs> so I don't know. But anyway, we'll keep at it. But uh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, okay. And I did try a brother printer. My wife has a brother laser printer, and I tried that. I knew I was pretty sure it wouldn't work because I'd heard reports that the, the brother toner does not transfer well. And uh, they were right. So, uh, yeah. Okay, that's good. And a uh, uh, guy local here, he's uh, bought a milling machine. So when he's doing the through-hole stuff, uh, he just changes the bit for his milling machine, and it drills all the holes for him. So... I was kind of waiting. He's having a fair bit of uh, success with his uh, with his uh, mill that he bought. I think he paid about six hundred bucks for it, and uh, he's getting down into the SNT stuff. He's got he's getting that all figured out. So it's he's he's almost got me convinced to go buy one. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see what happens. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Wayne. I look forward to uh, part two of uh, KeyCAD next month or this month, I should say. Yeah, later this month. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hassan, I think you had a comment, did you not? Yeah, I have some an update. So, well, actually, wait, did you, a comment on Wayne or? Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, I guess I talked to no. him. I lost track. Did you have a comment, on Wayne? No, it wasn't me. Okay, I'll come back to you then. Um, Howard, you're up next. Good evening. Uh, haven't been doing very much. Um, just been busy with some other things, but. I have been looking into uh, whether or not when I bring the antenna down to replace the roof on my house to use a toroid based common mold choke, either a commercial one or build one to replace the uh, coax wrapped around a piece of plastic pipe. So that's the only thing I've really been looking into doing, just advantages and disadvantages of that. Okay. Did you finish your, your AT project? What's that? Did you finish your antenna tuner project? I can't remember. Well, no, I I had did a first attempt to cut the hole in the front of the case for the OLED display, and that didn't go very well. No. Well, the last time we talked, everything was going well. Obviously, you shouldn't have said anything then because it went. Yeah, I know. I know. I got well. The back part went well because that's just holes for the SSO two thirty nines and power plug. But when I went to cut the hole to do the front part, no, that didn't go that well. So. Yeah. Has anybody here got experience uh, drilling square holes in uh, plexiglass? <laughs> no, I gave up on the plexiglass and went to the metal. Well, you've gone to metal. Okay. Well, yeah. that problem's now solved. So now you can 3D print uh, the bezels for it. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess that's the thing. i got to come up with uh, some sort of bezel. Maybe use that. Maybe make that out of plexiglass. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks uh, for that, uh, Howard. Okay, Ken, welcome back to uh, Civilization. How was your camping trip? It was excellent. We're doing laundry and we're packing up the car and leaving again. <laughs> nice. I wish, permanently. That was good. It's good. Uh, last few weeks, I haven't been doing much other than working. Uh, Bonnie and I uh, usually take about a week off where we go camping to Earl Row, just north of Elliston. Uh, Earl Provincial Park. Uh, this year, I snuck my radio and, and an antenna into the car, and she didn't even ask me until we got there. So, anyways, uh, this year I yep. took uh, uh, I took my uh, Deep Cycle uh, 110 amp hour battery with me. I took my uh, Yesu and my uh, my fiberglass uh, pop up uh, mast. And uh, I didn't get around to setting up till what Tuesday, uh, Sunday, Saturday. We uh, we set up in the rain. It didn't let go. Uh, Sunday was like thirty two. Monday was like thirty four. So I didn't get around to put up the antenna till Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday uh, I set up the radio, and I started off at twenty five watts, and. Uh, I did a, a ton of porta contacts, parks on the air. Uh, every time I made a contact, they they kept asking me if I was uh, if this was a park to park because I signed my call sign as portable. And of course, I told them no. You get more points for that. Uh, I did that for a while, so probably about uh, twelve porta contacts on twenty five watts. Uh, the next day. Uh, I set up again, 
and uh, did a couple more port of contacts. Then all of a sudden, I hear Italy coming through with a big pile up. And uh, I kept trying for about a half an hour, and I bumped the power up to 40 watts, and I made my first ever DX contact. Yay! Finally, I got a 5.6 from the guy, uh, both both clear, and it uh, worked quite well. Uh, maybe about ooh, 45 minutes later, I made my second ever DX contact uh, into uh, uh, Suriname, South America, uh, the country just above Brazil, uh, Papa Zula 2 Yankee Tango. Uh, another pile up there. When I uh, when I got onto the channel, he was just starting, and uh, people were jumping in, and I got uh, fourth in line, and I got the same report from him five six, okay. and, and uh, I'm so happy. That's my second DX contact in my life. Oh, there you go, Ken. So now the bug has really bitten you. Yeah. Uh, I would have liked to stay uh, at 25 watts with him, but uh, I had to crank up the power to 40 before I could uh, he before he could hear me. Yeah. But that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. That's good. Now we just got to get you on CW. Yeah, that's, ne that's next. Okay. All right, Hassan, you're up next. All right. So busy time. I got an antenna finally, or antenna mast. Wow. So, okay, let me start with this. Um, can you guys see the video? Yeah. Are you seeing front or back? Oh, I see your face. What does that mean? Oh, oh. let me swap. There we go. Okay, so I bought some additions to my SDR. This is a low noise amplifier. This is an AM filter. And I finally invested in a set of decent connectors and cables. Um, so this is good. So now I can actually, uh, the, the bands are a lot clearer. And uh, so using the SDR program, I mean, I, I, can, I can actually, you know, hear stuff on the four, 20 meter, 40 meter band. Problem is that I was trying to upgrade my program and then I, I don't know, I installed some libraries and now none of them work. <laughs> so I tried two or three of them and they all kind of they don't work with my Blade RF so I'm going to have to figure out something but that's why I was interested in what Frank was doing so that's project number one project number two I had to drive out to the boonies a place called Newcastle, Ontario oh, I thought you were going to say Paris, Ontario <laughs> nah, closer to your end of the woods so I got this I bought this off a of hand. This is a vacuum tube pre-selector. It's a regen receiver. So it just tunes on a few bands, 7 megahertz, 1.8, 3.5. And what this will do is just select one channel and use the amazing selectivity of a regen. And it'll actually then pipe that into your radio. So apparently it's a great way to boost the gain. I was trying my Drake out and I realized it's it's got very poor sensitivity. Um, even though it has 300 watts of power, I can barely hear anything on the bands. So, I mean, I thought this would be kind of, I was going to build one of these anyways. That's so when someone sold it and he, you know, he did such a great job with the construction. I figured, why not? I'll just buy it. Yeah. Well, you've been busy. Well, that's, and that's just, that's number two. Number three is I hooked up my antenna properly. I used the top rail, as I think Drew who mentioned it, so it's actually, the mast is much more stable. It's not flopping in the wind like this piece of wood that was kind of bending over. And I'll show you guys the, the fiberglass mast, the spider beam. This thing here, it's a 40 foot mast. Well, not right now. It telescopes <laughs> downwards, but it's 12 meters high, 40 feet in the air. And it's amazing. It's, I can carry it with one hand and you know, super, super tall. So my thought was I was going to try to um, put a vertical on there and also try to tie a horizontal from there to my chimney. But I, I mean, now I'm, I can't decide what to do. Like so many configurations, so many ways to do it. 
I, I got to worry about the ground plane. Too much experimenting. So I'm kind of overwhelmed right now. Well, you could probably, uh, off the top of my head, I would say, filter out all the mistakes Dave made and go <laughs> with, what he ended, what he, with what he ended up with. Ah. Uh, you know? Okay. Well, he, did a lot of, he did a lot of experimenting on, uh, on that sort of stuff. So... He's the resident expert on that kind of stuff, I think, uh, has said. And he's checked in, so I'm sure you'll have a comment when it gets around to him. Or maybe he has a comment now on it. But um, Yeah, I need to live vicariously through Dave. Yeah. I also noticed you had a paddle there beside the, one of your, your Drake there. So that's that's promising. Yeah, I bought that. It's a CW paddle, and it's it's beautifully machined and everything. I even got a trainer as well, like a made out of uh, wood and a small circuit. So... Yeah, I was, I was trying that. I mean, I, I use, um, I mean, I've just tried using reverse beacons, and I can get picked up as far as Germany sometimes, and you know, like different parts of the U.S. easily, and so it's, it is working. But I've, I mean, I haven't, I, I still haven't figured out how to do Morse code yet. So that's still a work in progress. Yeah, it's called practice. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, Hassan. Thanks for that. Good stuff. Good evening, Al. How are you tonight? I hope my microphone's on. Hi, everybody. Been listening along here, being very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, I haven't been too active. Work's been getting in the way, but uh, I've managed to do a couple of things. Uh, low tech. Uh, I, I picked myself up uh, a Bayou Jumper uh, Paraset kit from the Four State QRP Club. Yeah. So uh, getting ready to build that. So I've been doing uh, carpentry. I've got to build a, a, a nice wooden box to put this thing in. So uh, uh, it's a bit of a stretch. I'm working with wood, but that's electronics, isn't it? Uh, anyhow, we're doing that. Well, uh, not being a metal guy, I guess working with wood is kind of counterintuitive. But uh, Well, I, I tell you, I, I'm probably more of a, uh, a metal guy, but... Uh, I'll put anything in my machine, machines, whether it's plastic, wood. Uh, heck, a sewing machine is another power tool, right? So uh, I don't like to be uh, uh, constrained to one medium. A sewing machine? You mean you make your own clothes? Well, I've done boat tops and uh, saddlebags and uh, nice. I've done, uh, uh, a nice bag for the probes for my oscilloscope. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, you can put anything through a sewing machine. So uh, think of it as uh, another power tool. It's not just a tool for the ladies. Uh, it, it can do a lot of things. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll agree with that one. Then. It's another um, tool. All right. Well, I, I, don't I, <laughs> I don't know whether anybody recognizes this thing. This is what I've been up just past a day or two, or last week or two. But if anybody remembers the, uh, the park tester. Yeah. Well, here it is in... Uh, a Hammond case. So that's what I've been up to uh, over the last week. But a, a Hammond case, cut out that rectangular hole. That is a pain in the backside. Got that in. And uh, uh, I took the zero insertion socket out. Uh, that was proving to be a, a bit of a hassle to put into the case. But put that in there. And the nice thing is on the back side of this, you do have the, uh, uh, the battery compartment in there. So it makes just a... a a nice package, uh, uh, a little more uh, professional looking than the bare circuit board. So uh, that's kind of what I've been up to. Okay, good. Yeah, because they'd remind you, there's the uh, part that the tester works well. And, you know, I've never used a, I've never used a zero insertion uh, socket. So, but anyway, so I can see uh, in your case, you just left it out and you probably won't miss it. No, no, and it makes a nice addition to the kit. It looks very professional, so I'm pretty happy with that. So, uh, oh, that's well, good. what else can I say? Oh, one other comment on those PC boards. You know when they say FCC on it, certified? Doesn't that mean uh, fake Chinese corporation? Um, <laughs> doesn't that certify it for use in North America? <laughs> oh, wow. I hadn't heard that one before. That's a good one. <laughs> right. Anyhow, uh, a slow month, but uh, uh, you know it's summertime, so uh, that's once right. Get into the fall, I'll probably uh, do a little bit more uh, aggressive uh, playing around. So okay. that's all I've got to report this one. All right, thanks, Al. We'll we'll allot you some more time. Come maybe October then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, Dave, good evening. You made it. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> so, what are we doing? Yeah. Well, I know what you've kind of been doing. You, you've been you're you're alive. You're on the air. Yeah, I got so I got one antenna up. Uh, tried it out last night. I put it up in the weekend. It's what I've been uh, talking about for the past six or seven months now about the uh, long wire antenna. So I got it up and it's working better than I expected. Well, that's uh, well, that's uh, definitely a good thing. So now, how are you going to improve it? I'm not. I'm just leaving it. It's up. It's it's uh, up there. So um, now I just got my mounts for my uh, for my R5. Okay. Well, well this just, while you're look, looking for it, Eric has got a cut. Oh, no, this just it. came. This just came in the mail today. So that's going to be. Oh man, this thing's heavy. So this is going to be put on the side of the house to hold the mast up. That's going to hold my R5. So, so that's oh, so you're bolting that to the side to the brick then. Yeah. And how high was the base going to be then? Well, about six feet or so. Oh, the the mast. How high is going to be? The base of the R5. You're going to put a mast there on top of that bracket, and then how far would? Well, no, no, that that bracket holds a mast against the house going up and down. The mask so, comes all the way to the ground yeah. and goes up, and that just attaches it two places to the house. How and high will the uh, base of your R5 be? About 25 feet. Okay. Yeah. So ideally, it should be 30 feet for 20 meters, half wave, right? But uh, I, uh, 25 feet is, if I go another five feet higher, it means I'll probably have, have to guide it. I don't. Trust that mast, right? So yeah, I don't I have a piece of mine up about 35 feet, I think, if I recall. Yeah, I don't want to be guying uh, stuff. Well, I don't guy mine. It's not you don't have to guy an R5. Yeah. Well, no, but it's the it's the mast. Yeah, I I think I have a 20 foot mast, and I think it's up. I think I got it out about around 15 feet up. So, uh, Eric has got a comment. He's he keeps flashing me here. He's got he's dying to talk to you. Go ahead, Eric. Actually, I didn't realize I was unmuted, but uh, anyway, hopefully my peanut eating is not bothering anyone. Uh, yeah, I'm offended, Dave. You'll talk to the reverse beacon network, but you won't like have a QSO with me. Not nice. Hey, I just got this thing working <laughs> last night. My, my uh, ham radio deluxe, because my the, the PC I'm on now, it, it, the disc fried. See? See what it says there? It says kaput. Broken. 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 I don't know. Too I, much RF to it? Sounds, sounds, that sounds like excuses. I just hear that snobs live in Paris. No, no, that disc died. <laughs> All my configs for everything. For my um, interface, everything died. Everything, I lost everything. So I have to go and reconstruct it and I, I, man, I just love Ham Radio Deluxe. It actually tucked backup files all over the place for a configuration. So I was able to get all my configs back, all my logs, everything came back. Lucky you. Yeah. Do you so, have a comment uh, for, for Dave? Yeah, I was just going to comment on the, the temporary antenna. I, my temporary antenna has been up for five years. So. <laughs> I'm not putting up it. I'm not, I don't have a temporary antenna. I put up a permanent antenna. I mounted it to the side of my house. It's up there permanently. I put a wire antenna up. So it's before, back in January. Yeah, it was Jan. Was it, when, when did I do that presentation for long wire antenna? It's cold. Yeah, that was December, January. I had a temporary antenna on my fence, uh, on my backyard. But my intention was to get that to work and then move it, mount it at the side of my house. So I have it going around the side of my house. Yeah, I have one of those temporary antennas. I put it up in the backyard and the XYL made a comment about it. And I said, don't worry, it's only going to be up for a couple of weeks. And that was about five years ago. Well, just wait till my mask goes, goes up. 
I, I figured out a place where it's least intrusive. So hopefully uh, no one complains about it because it's a tight neighborhood, house beside house beside house. And so all I got to do is put up an antenna and someone goes and complains to the city and the city comes by and says, take it down, right? Why would they tell you that? They can they can say anything they want. They can't. Uh, we won't get into it here. Okay. Um, all right. That's it for the round. Oh, Dave. Uh, before, uh, do you have any any comments on the uh, on the, on our homebrew meetings going forward? Any any thoughts there? Uh, with respect to what? Well, what your preference is? Uh, do you prefer the uh, you know all uh, all in on the uh, video uh, the online stuff, and then maybe have one or two uh, big beats or or uh, you know all day event kind of thing or four quarterly yeah. meetings? What's yeah, I think I think having a kind of an all-day event once in a while is probably a good idea, but stick with the uh, with the virtual sessions. It seems to be working out good. How many people do we have tonight? Uh, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven people. Yeah, we had uh, Michael was here earlier, but then he uh, had to leave. So, so we're a couple of shy tonight of our of our usual our usual lot. So we seem to be doing okay. Oh, that's good. All right. Does anybody else have any other uh, comments, uh, questions, or queries, or you name it? Comment for Al um, about the sewing. I actually bought, went to Fabricland the other day, and oh. and I bought some material to make a desktop out of. So I've got a standing desk, and I've got some two by twelves, and I was gonna cover it with copper sheeting, but it's not gonna work. So I I bought this fake vinyl, and I'm gonna glue it onto the the desk. So I just thought I'd mention that, like fabric glue is is good if you don't have a sewing machine. I, I think you two should start a new uh, groups IO here if you're going to start talking fabric. <laughs> <laughs> Radio contact sewing club. Works really well. <laughs> and, uh, contact cement works pretty well, and you can even spray it out of a spray gun. Ah, oh, right. I'll try that too. Out of a can. <laughs> Build an antenna with that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Question for the question for everyone actually I, does anybody know how to put a stick a pulley up in a tree because i want to yeah. tie one end of the antenna to a tree but i mean i'm not sure the right way to do it i know the perfect way you get a tree company to come in and uh, remove some old limbs and dead wood off your tree and while they're up there get them to put it up there for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a great idea Oh, I, I talked to, that's what I talked to about two years ago. I had a discussion with the guy I had in here doing the stuff. And he says, yeah, sure, no problem, whatever you want. And as a matter of fact, he even offered me, when they when their pulleys go out of date, he says, I'll hang on to a couple of them for you and give them to you because they they, uh, they only use them for, I think, a season or a couple of seasons, and then they trash them. So mm -hmm. uh, he might end up with some free pulleys. Um, was it Al that wanted to – somebody wanted to make a comment. I can't remember who it was. Yeah, it was Al. Um, yeah, I had to uh, put new pulleys up in my trees this year. After 20 years, the uh, the dipoles started to fall down. Actually, it was uh, a family of squirrels decided they liked the uh, uh, the ropes and they started to eat them. But uh, uh, I was able to get them up a good distance. I, I bought uh, uh, three lengths of progressively smaller PVC conduit. I think the biggest one was about two and a half diameter, then two inch, and then one and a half. Put them all together, and I had this. Uh, uh, and how long are they? They've got to be uh, 15 foot lengths. So it was uh, quite uh, quite limp, like a wet noodle. But I was able to get that uh, halfway up the trunk of the tree and start pushing it up from the bottom. And of course, I had a weight on the other end and a uh, and a rope, and I was able to pass a. Uh, uh, a rope over one of the, the tallest branches in the tree. So uh, I think a lot of it depends on your particular situation and uh, what your tree looks like, how high it is, where the branches are, but it can be done uh, without uh, climbing. Uh, I don't climb anymore. Uh, I know years ago when I moved in here, I had a beautiful tree and uh, a climbing tree. And I guess I was already in my, my 40s and I decided to climb this thing. Got halfway up and realized I wasn't 13 anymore. <laughs> Pretty tough time coming down. <laughs> so yeah. we learned a lesson. I don't climb trees anymore. Yeah, I think Hassan's still young enough to climb. I'm getting up there. It's I used to scamper up like nothing, and now I have to think about it. 
th- and I have to, I'm always thinking of the downward journey. <laughs> but, 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 going up is easy. It's the, the downward journey is harder. Yes. But so you just slung the wire over a branch um, and just hung it down straight? Well, yeah, I, uh, I, I took a, a weight, a piece of scrap metal, um, tied a rope around it, and I sent the rope down the middle of all this PVC pipe and then pulled it tight so the weight was at the very uh, uh, top end and then started trying to get this thing up uh, the trunk of the tree, uh, pushing it as I, as I went. And uh, when I finally got over a branch that I wanted to uh, put the rope over, I uh, gave it a good, uh, uh, I guess, jerk. And then the weight fell off the top of the, uh, uh, the jiffy pole and the weight came down and drooped a, uh, a rope over the branch. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll try that. And then what I did is I, uh, I took um, plastic coated uh, steel um, laundry uh, line and then hauled that back up over the, uh, uh, the branch and I made an endless loop of that. Nice thing being is uh, you can actually uh, pull it over the branch and it'll actually slide on the plastic. And then uh, where I joined it, I uh, fixed a pulley and then I hauled the pulley up to the top branch. So if I need to bring the pulley down for maintenance, I, uh, I loosen the, uh, the steel cable and pull it down. I can change the pulley and then I can haul it back. Up again. Yeah. And how do you, you fix the pulley to the tree? I'm not too far away. I'm just in uh, Cooksville, Miss- Mississauga. Well, that's right, I didn't hear that. If you want to see uh, how I've done it, stop by. I'm not too far from you. I'm, I'm oh, sure. Mississauga. All right. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see it. Well, sounds like you've jumped in the car already. <laughs> <laughs> That's the local bozos on the street. With uh-huh. the- okay. Hey, Hassan, I got a potato gun you can use. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you mentioned about climbing up a tree and then not coming down so well, uh, two houses back, I uh, when we moved in, I put an antenna up on the roof, and uh, eh, it was okay, you know. Climbed up, no problem, out on the eve and hanging out in the end to get up on the second level tier of the roof. And then uh, a couple of years later, we were, were moving and it came time to go get the antenna. So away I go, I back up onto the roof and I climb up and I'm a little more nervous this time than I was, uh, that I remembered, but I managed to get up onto the roof. And the tricky part well, on the second level of the roof is that the only way to get out there is to kind of hang over on the outside edge and kind of jump up onto the second level. So I got the antenna down and put it in a spot where I could pick up on it. And then I had to come down over that tricky part and I did not want to do it. And the only reason why I ended up uh, sucking it up and getting it done was because I was too embarrassed to holler for my wife to come and get me. <laughs> <laughs> All I need is have her call the fire department to get me down off the roof. So I sucked it up and came down. <laughs> and after that, I hire somebody now. <laughs> anyway. Okay, uh, any other uh, comments, stories, uh, what have you? Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, it was another enjoyable evening. Uh, lots of interesting thoughts and ideas, and everybody's up to some interesting things. So I thank again everybody for joining us, and I guess we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And uh, Wayne will have uh, part two of uh, Key CAD. And hopefully, uh, maybe some have had some chance to try it out. So you might have some questions for uh, for Wayne. And uh, well, we'll see you then. So good night, all. Take care, right. Seven, Take care all. guys. Hey, Peter, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Do you, are you right. going to use the drone with the antenna mapping program? Uh, that's the plan. Yeah. Uh, I think the project will probably end up being like. Two parts. One, the intent to have the design in there where it could be lifted by a drone. And I suspect, though, that it would probably be used more by somebody walking around. Mm. But um, I mean, Dave had some interesting thoughts on how to accomplish uh, accomplish that uh, for the drone part. Um, but I haven't had a chance to uh, sit down with uh, Kevin to really discuss, uh, you know, the next steps right now. We're into just the preliminary designs. The uh, uh, right now I'm waiting for Kevin to come back with uh, the pinouts and stuff like that so I can finish off the keycad drawing. But 
But yeah, well, one of these days we're going to sit down and have to have a, a little bit of a gypsy session, I guess, and really truly map out the project on how we want to do it. But uh, yeah, the idea is to is to have it light enough that we could put it up into a, a drone. Yeah, I remember that discussion. Really good idea. So I wonder if the drone would help with the vertical component. Well, that would be the idea, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that would be an interest. I mean, it'd be interesting just walking around the the far field and making those measurements, but. Uh, the ability to uh, see what's going on up on the vertical side of things would be uh, that much more rewarding. Yeah. yeah. So that would be the intent. Do you have a drone, Howard? No, no, but I used one at in my day job at work, an industrial one. Okay. So they're uh, they're pretty capable, but the small ones will do the same oh. thing. What are the think? What are what are the odds of getting you to go over to Kingston Airport and uh, rent a Cessna and fly circles around our houses? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could get low enough to do that. Not legally. <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes these planes seem to fly pretty low over here, but anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll see you. All right. Cheers. Hey, Dave. Before you go, what, 